Okay, welcome back everyone to another one of our corn streams, <laughs> Answers for COVID-19. I was in a public school board meeting. I was counting on Kimberly to take the lead here, but we just concluded within the minute. So uh, as I gather myself here, <laughs> um, as always, I'm Abraro Mesh, one of your members at large on the Fairfax County School Board. And I'm Kimberly Watang, the student rep to the school board. Excellent. Um, so uh, today we are going to have a overall updates as always. Uh, then we're gonna have a conversation with Elaine Tolan, my colleague from the Drainsville district who also just wrapped up this call uh, to discuss the budget, all things answering your questions. Today was a big, big vote. We finally approved the budget. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, it's been months and months of a process and we've had to do it twice because of COVID. So we'll you know, take all questions and try to simplify what that was about. And finally, we will have Joanna Hemet from the health department who will join us to give us updates on the latest with uh, what's going on in Fairfax County. You know, it's been a little confusing. The governor said something, we have a different order. So she'll help us better understand what's going on. Um, all right, so I will go ahead here and get started. Um, we have a couple of things. Last session, we, um, I'm gonna get myself ready here. As I said, we just got off this meeting. Um, so uh, we last time had a special senior Sunday uh, to honor our class of 2020 uh, because we do know this year is quite unique um, and not you know uh, as expected. So we, if you I didn't get the chance to tune into that, I highly encourage you to go back and look at the video. We had a special speaker for you guys, um, and we also had Dr. Francis Ivy who explained uh, you know uh, all questions about graduation. In addition to class council representatives from nearly all the high schools uh, who provided spe specific updates um, about those schools. So if you're a senior, would highly recommend taking a look. Um, moving from that, we still are in a um, critical kind of situation. So the cases are lowering day by day, but be mindful that we still have 8,677 total cases in Fairfax County. 423 um, of those are new today, 317 DCs and 1,181 hospitalized. So we are not at the point where we should be walking around. I know Memorial Day is coming up. Everybody stay home or find a really, really safe way um, to you know, maybe go to a trail or something and socially distance six feet apart, wear a mask. We still need to do uh, all the measures to make sure we're safe and healthy. And if if it's not enough motivation to protect yourself and you think you're immune and healthy, which none of us are, uh, it's to protect others. You would never wanna be the reason to cause someone else death. Um, so putting that out there. All right, of course, as always, if you want to get updates on our corn streams, uh, a text update, you can text 81010 with the at sign, Q-U-A-R-A-N-S-T-R, which is for corn stream to get uh, text reminders about each session. We do these Thursdays and Sundays at 7 p.m. All right, um, so I also wanted to make sure I mentioned last time we did not have the chance to uh, point out a couple of other graduation celebration events that are happening. Um, so for our seniors, Teen Vogue is having a virtual high school and college commencement event. That is gonna be on May 31st, so in about 10 days, um, make sure you tune in. We'll have some, there are going to be some really cool people like Stacey Abrams, Jamil Jamil, Jamila Jamil, Tracy Ellis Ross, Ali Raisman, also Noor Taguri, who fun fact is my cousin. Um, but they will be speaking along with uh, Anna Wintour and um, celebrating our seniors. In addition, uh, YouTube is doing Dear Class of 2020. That's going to be on June 12th, so closer to your actual graduation um, at 3 p.m. And that'll be on YouTube, people like Barack and Michelle Obama, Lady Gaga, Condoleezza Rice, Malala Yousafzai, uh, Sundar Pichai, and Robert Gates will be speaking. So be sure to you know, take that moment to celebrate yourself because you do deserve it and you've earned it um, on those two dates. So we have been mentioning reminders about elections that are happening in Fairfax County. Uh, we have uh, one of them that just happened on the 19th, a few days ago. Uh, and there were a number of changes in our Vienna, Clifton, and Fairfax City uh, local councils. So congratulations to all the winners. Um, we had a, a returning um, 
School Board Chair for Fairfax City, Carolyn Pitches, who joined us for a session before. Take a look at that if you're interested. Uh, and a number of folks who are returning, but also some newer faces. So uh, if that is of interest to you in Clifton, Fairfax City in Vienna, be sure to Google it. It is available now. Um, finally, uh, actually, I'll, take, I'll move it to Kimberly to give us two general updates and then talk about food and technology. So all Fairfax County Public Schools sponsors um, summer programs, including rec pack programs held at local schools, summer programs um, sponsored by NCS or SAC programs are canceled. So Fairfax County Schools are looking at um, staggered schedules, Saturday classes, desk spread set, like um, farther apart, the um, number of children in each classroom being limited, limiting students to one per seat at a school bus, millions, um, millions for extra spending as a part of their proposal for changes needed to reopen in the fall. So the school system also budgeted $600,000 to hire more nurses to help students socially distance and learn more about hygiene in their in the proposal. So just to emphasize that the school board is putting a lot of energy into making sure that all of us when we end up returning to school that we end up returning to school in a safe manner and that they are emphasizing that they're putting our health first. So that's really important. So for food, as of May 21st, which is today, STPS has distributed a total of 1,025,329 meals. So we broke the 1 million mark. So that's really cool. Um, and food will be distributed as normal on on Monday, May 25th, I believe that's Memorial Day. So even though it's a holiday, food will still be distributed as per usual. And for tech, um, as of the as of May 19th, there's been 18,744 laptops distributed and 1,562 MiFi devices. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so taking a look at our academic situation, hopefully folks are settled in their classes now. If you're listening to the stream, I imagine you have internet and hopefully have been able to connect to your uh, classes. Um, so far, there have been 248,869 attendees in the sessions. Um, and we um, don't have particularly new info on academics other than the fact that AP exams end tomorrow. Congratulations to everyone who has been working so hard. I know Kimberly, <laughs> you and your peers have been studying and uh, working it um, to, to be successful. So, uh, you know, and, and if you face any technical difficulties, there is a backup email submission method. Uh, so just make sure you find that email um, so that you're not kind of stuck uh, on test day if you're not able to log in or anything like that. And makeup testing will take place the first week of June. So stay tuned if you, if you missed anything. Um, but yeah, congratulations to everyone who has finished those and good luck to everyone who has them uh, tomorrow. Uh, Kimberly will give us some updates on special ed and then we will move to our guests for today. So in terms of special education, the Department of Special Services provided an electronic newsletter on May 18th available on the SCPS website. So it provides videos on behavioral um, intervention services and applied behavioral analysis video par parent training. So FCPS will provide class-based extended school year services virtually from June 29th through July 24th. Fairfax County is providing free online suicide prevention training to educators, parents, and other adults working with youth through the Cognito at-risk training module. So you'll have to um, visit the Fairfax County website, at, which is fairfaxcounty.gov, enter Cognito in the search box, scroll down to the bottom of the page to create an account and to get started or visit the um, Cognito's website at HTTPS, you, you know that vibe, you know how that works, um, fairfax.cognito.com. Um, so I actually do recommend that because um, I think all 10th graders were supposed to take the Cognito, um, uh, what's it called, training module. So I do like highly recommend it, it was very helpful. So IEP progress reports will be emailed to parents no later than Friday, May 22nd which is tomorrow. For parents without an email listed to, with um, FCPS, progress reports will be mailed. So special education students will not um, receive an IEP progress report for the fourth quarter. Thank you, thank you, Kimberly. And with that, uh, before we go into resources, we'll share those at the end. Um, I'm gonna welcome Elaine Tolan. Hello. 
Hi there. Hi. We can't see yeah. you. I know. I'm going to get my video going. <laughs> there here. we go. It's kind of dark. Yeah. Elaine <laughs> is my colleague on the board. She represents the Drainsville District. How are you? I'm doing fine after our what, six and a half hour meeting. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> started in the broad daylight and now I realize I'm sitting in a pitch black room. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So I'll have to turn some lights on. Yeah, sure. No, I go for it at any point. But it is the nature of our work at this point. I was just sharing with everyone. I had just jumped on to try to catch a seven o'clock um, you know, yeah. session here. So yeah. So I, yeah. Um hi Kimberly. Um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, we want to talk about a little bit about the budget tonight. Yeah, so just breaking it down for folks. I mean, we've been trying to provide updates for everyone and, you know, we encourage our audience if you have, uh, you know, questions about specific budget days to look at some of our previous sessions. But now that we voted on it, today was a big day. Um, so just kind of backtracking a little bit. What is the budget process, you know, broadly? Um, and, and I'll fill in here and there too, but I wanted to make sure they had the chance to hear it from you too. Um, yeah. What even happened today? Let's start with that. <laughs> well, so today we um, finalized our vote on the, the budget for the next school year. So um, I think one thing I've learned, you know, being on the board just since January, you know, with the Briar is that, um, you know, we voted today. Uh, so we've got some big decisions behind us on, uh, you know, what we're funding moving forward into um, you know, the fall and the, the, well, our fiscal year, let me back up for a second, starts on July 1st. So the money that we're talking and why we voted on it in this time frame is because the, the money needs to be available for hiring um, people over the summer and, you know, for our, our next school year. So our, our fiscal year runs from July 1 to, uh, you know, June 30th, the following year. So the, the, the money we voted on today starts being spent on July 1, so this coming summer. So, um, you know, we've been through lots of work sessions talking about what priorities are. Of course, the, um, you know, staff works on bringing forward to us uh, what they think, um, you know, the best way for us to spend our uh, funding will be. And of course, this year we went through it twice, uh, given that, um, you know, we thought we had just about finished it up by the end of uh, February. And then, of course, now we are dealing with COVID-19. So, some very, very different budget realities. But um, primarily, you know, as you know, we have a very large budget, 3.2 you know, billion dollars. But um, a lot of that is in, you know, fixed, like over 90% of it is a fixed cost for salaries. So uh, we didn't dive into that. Um, for this year, we are looking at, um, you know, taking a deeper dive as we move forward into the, the next year's budget um, starting next fall to really dive into well, what are those salaries? What is that whole big chunk of, uh, of the budget that we didn't look at that closely? So mainly what we've been looking at over the last couple of months is um, you know, how we want to spend um, any spending above and beyond that. And we started out talking about that being about $172 million. And then with the realities of COVID-19, that was cut back very quickly to, um, I would forget the exact number, it was like 68 million, something like that, right, Abrar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, that's the number. And so, um, you know, so that's what we really voted on today is how that money would be um, spent and divvied up and, um, you know, giving some guidelines to staff to do that. So. Um, we did have a public hearing about a week and a half ago, so the public was able to give comments. And of course, um, I've had a number of constituents um, emailing me and calling me and giving me uh, feedback on the budget, you know, all along the way. We also very close collaboration and conversations with our um, teachers unions and, you know, other groups to um, gather input on the budget. We have a number of um, citizen organizations that send us uh, very uh, detailed analyses, which we really appreciate. And so we've taken all of that into consideration to come up with what we, you know, voted on today. So um, I think that it was very clear from what we voted on that, um, you know, this particular board and, you know, staff very focused on the um, overall wellness of our students, you know, social and emotional 
well-being and we had some you know additional funding uh, well allocated some of that additional funding for you know counselors social workers um, nurses um, psychologists that's the one I'm, I'm forgetting on the list and yeah. parent liaisons yes and parent liaisons and um, you know so that was really good and um, unfortunately the the big thing that was dropped from our budget with the impact of COVID-19, which I'm very sad about, but was the uh, salary increases for our staff. Um, and as we discussed today at the board meeting, you know, we really appreciate the um, backing of our, um, you know, our principals associations and our teachers associations and understanding um, why that had to happen at this time. Um, one of the things I think that we asked for, which is a little bit different, um, then in previous years is we were very, very focused on having a quarterly review of the budget and how it's being spent and what it's being spent on um, as we move through the next fiscal year with the impact of COVID-19 in particular. We don't really know, um, you know, we're still debating on, you know, what our, our schools are going to look like in the fall. So expenditures may fluctuate. Um, you know, in different ways than we are expecting. So we, we want, um, you know, we very carefully instructed staff and the superintendent to give us those um, quarterly reports so we can be revisiting, um, you know, what our expenditures are and what our priorities are. We also um, don't have a complete picture on what funding we may receive from the federal government and what funding we may have from the state as the year pans out. So we wanna be in sort of, you know, a flexible position to take advantage of um, hopefully additional funding um, beyond what we're expecting. So I don't know, I've talked a lot. Abra, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, no, that was good. Um, I just break down a couple of things. So you mentioned the fiscal year, which is really, really important, right? Essentially in, um, Taking that out of uh, school board English, uh, basically uh, it, that's just the, the cycle for when the budget, um, when we plan for the budget, right? So are we talking about money right now? Or are we talking about money a few months later for next year? So that um, that's kind of how you can think of that. And then yes, to your point, Elaine. So when we say we wanna review it quarterly, we will be every few months meeting again as a board to look at, you know, are there any updates on the revenues? How is the economy doing? Do we have more money, less money? And what decisions do we have to make as a result of that? So, yeah. I mean, a good example, we've made some big decisions around technology acquisitions that we didn't anticipate that we would be making um, at the time that we did. We needed to make our, uh, we should have been voting today, for example, on whether we were moving forward with FCPS on for middle school. But however, we yeah. I'm not sure the exact date, you know, we had to vote on that in March um, because of what is happening, um, you know, just in the economy uh, and with COVID-19 and every single school district in the entire United States having to suddenly do distance learning. So the demand for computers skyrocketed. I mean, not just, you know, school districts suddenly having to do distance learning, but every company having all of their employees working from home. So, um, you know, we were contacted by our supplier, by Dell, you know, the supplier of our laptops. They said, if you don't get your order in now, you know, you're not going to have computers for your middle school kids in, you know, August. So we needed to expedite that decision. Likewise, we had not intended necessarily to be handing out computers to our elementary school students, but given the situation that we're in, you know, we've been doing that. And so, you know, today, one of the things we did vote on was moving forward with, um, you know, putting in an, an order for an additional 22,000 laptops so that we could provide laptops to our fifth and sixth graders that need them. Yeah. And, and these are, I mean, technology equipment like that is massively expensive, right? And it takes a lot of planning for us to think through, you know, how do we want it to be implemented? What are the, because a lot of parents have been concerned, right? You're going to increase screen mm -hmm. time for kids. And those were a lot of the reasons why originally we were voting for middle school FCPS on now, right? To have a, that process. But with COVID, all of a sudden we found ourselves, as you pointed out, um, having to prioritize that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so, the, good news, yeah. the good news on some of that computer expenditure, like the 22,000 laptops that we're talking about today, is we do um, you know, have confidence that we will be receiving uh, money from the you know, federal CARES grant to the tune of about um, $20.9 million. Um, so, and that is money that right. has to be spent on COVID related items. So, you know, we will be spend, you know, most likely spending money from that for those 22,000 laptops because it really is a COVID expenditure. You know, the other kinds of things we'll spend that money on will be, um, you know, cleaning supplies and protective gear that we'll need, you know, when students return to school. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And and the superintendent, you know, had floated around his thinking around hiring. Some people were asking what's happening with the 2020-20 hiring of support staff. Um, that was something discussed as a CARES package thing too. So in response to COVID, how what is the staffing that's going to be necessary as we move forward? And what, what are the superintendent's um, proposals on that? So he's still he still hasn't proposed that to us. We still haven't formally looked at it. Um, but just wanted to explain that because I know for folks who didn't hear about that today, just to you know know where that is. So to Elaine's yeah. point, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say our last discussion, um, we did have you know because if we hire additional counselors, that's a great example. Um, you know, that's a like a staff person. So we don't necessarily we really want to try to not use one time money for you know, like something from the, the, the CARES uh, grant for hiring those people, because then uh, what are we gonna do in the following year? You know, we know we need these additional counselors for the long run, we don't just need them for one year. So um, our budget staff has done a pretty good job of trying to, you know, look at the funding overall and how can we look at moving those positions uh, into uh, using funding categories that are recurring or that we do have year after year, and then really looking at where what can we use that COVID money for. Yeah, no, th thank you for that helpful uh, point as well. So, you know, in, for, in, in folks who are trying to wrap their heads around it, we have our normal process. You know, no, usually we kind of discuss the budget. We look at how much money we're getting projected to get. Then we send it to the Board of Supervisors. They kind of, you know, see if they agree with some of our priorities based on how much they not promised, but kind of said that they're going to give us. And if they approve it, uh, then that comes back to us as school board members. We can amend it. We can, you know, add a, different ideas and vote on it. That's what's normal. But now, <laughs> we know, we sent it. Then with COVID, we had these cuts, as Elaine mentioned. So we have had to look at it again um, and vote uh, or the, the superintendent actually proposed what he views the changes should be. Um, and we had a discussion on that last Thursday as a board mm -hmm. in a work session um, to see where folks, you know, whether they were supportive or not of different pieces of Dr. Bray Brand's recommendations. Most of his recommendations were things that the board supported. Um, and then uh, today we had this vote on the approved budget, which is all right, for this budget that as close to normal, the budget that we had been considering over the past several months, we approved that. But there are two budget conversations that remain. One is the one that Elaine mentioned, the CARES Act, uh, yeah, CARES Act package that we have, the, the 22 million. Uh, and the second is actually year-end budget planning. So every year, even after this budget process, the uh, board comes together to see, okay, we, you know, we budgeted for the year before. In June, how much of that did we not use? Uh, and can we uh, appropriate it in different places as we plan for the year after that? So that is still a conversation we're gonna have. Uh, and I know many of us have amendments and projects that we wanna push forth if, if uh, we do have a surplus. And it, it's gonna be an unusual year because you know with fuel costs and utilities, mm -hmm. and it's just really, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll have some money, but it's hard to know what's gonna happen. Yeah, it's, you know, I know um, Abrar, I think you've been, you've done a, a good job the last couple of weeks having some very close conversations with our budget staff on what, what is it looking yeah. like, um, you know, because we've got potential areas of savings, like you've mentioned, you know, we're not running the buses, so, you know, we're not paying for gasoline, we're not, you know, heating and air conditioning the buildings, you know, Summer our buildings are all online. down and, you know, pulled down to as, you know, low of an energy use as possible, given that there are very few people in the buildings each day. 
Um, so those those are areas where we're saving, you know, quite a bit of money. But on the other hand, you know, we're providing, you know, our meal services, right. you know, our grab and go lunches, which you know we would have some costs associated with food and nutrition anyway. But it's a, it's more expensive. We've got our packets that we've been mailing out. Um, you know, that was a, you know, about $4 million expenditure, just the production of those packets. Um, and then we've got, you know, some people out there, you know, working a lot of overtime, our custodians and our food and nutrition um, staff workers and things like that. So it, we have to see how it balances out. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's hard to know. I mean, with the different steps that we've been taking, even the professional development, just the training of staff, you know, to have to learn how to use all the technology and, and host sessions to teach kids. And uh, even that's a cost, right? That we may not even realize how much it's going to be in the end. So um, yeah, so we'll have that year end conversation. I wanted to walk through today in a little more detail. I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, for the benefit of everybody watching and that way it'll be easier for all of us to follow along here. Um, so we have, so as always, we've, you know, shown you guys in previous sessions, you want to go to the, um, if you want to find what the board is up to, you go to the main website in FCPS, you go to full menu over here. When you click that, there's a school board tab. When you click the school board tab, you're going to see this and you can click on board docs. That's where all our agendas, notes, attachments to anything relevant to board conversations is posted and that will take you to this screen where we were today for our regular meeting um, and if we click on that fun fact so some of you might see this agenda and see oh wait or we're watching on tv and think of them but the meeting ended around four something but there is also a closed session that the board uh has to participate in so you'll notice that that's just closed meeting uh listed here but in any case, so looking at today specifically, there you know we had some acknowledgments um, of Mental Health Awareness Month, for example, or Nurses Appreciation uh, Month, different things that we recognize. Oh, I know the eco schools, Abrar. Yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> the eco schools recognition that Elaine read and many many prizes, very impressive. I heard three of our schools uh, are the only three schools in the nation to have won right the silver award. Is no, that right? it's, it's called Is a that? permanent. It's called a permanent green flag. So the the Wildlife Federation has this program, and the, a green flag is the highest award that you can get. And um, if you achieve getting, but you can't. You can't, don't just get a green flag and then you're done. Like you have to keep working on it. So and in most four years, it, you said right. It takes two to three years for a school to get a green flag mm -hmm. because you it's significant. You've got to work on three different sustainability areas. And you really have to have sustainability in, infused in your community. And then, then you have to keep it up and you have to reapply like every two years for your green flag. And even the application process is pretty onerous, I have to admit. Um, so once you have achieved the four green flags, which means your school has been working on it for eight to 10 years. And you know our school district has been part of this program since 2009. So we have three schools, which are the only three in the entire country that have achieved this permanent green flag status. So yeah, Very impressive. it's really yes. exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you for uh, pointing it out. Um, you know, in addition to, we had the recognition for the voter registration competition, um, Herndon, I wanted to make sure I mentioned it because it is yeah, one of your schools so and mine, but yeah, Herndon High School was first place um, in that competition. So a number of recognitions, if you're interested, you can see the whole list. Um, and as always, there's citizen participation. So if you ever want to share anything with the board, uh, we will be all sitting there waiting to hear what you have to share. Uh, and then the budget piece. So Elaine, I'll um, let you go over a little bit of this. So, you know, the, the attachments are right here. I'll pull up the presentation. Um, actually, I had it right here already. And then we can go through a little bit of what the, um, what the motions that came up today were. So, yeah, so basically, you know, we had, um, you know, that we first voted on what, what we were just talking about, this overall plan for our funding. And, um, and then we had a whole list, I guess we had seven, well, we had two amendments. 
um, based upon, you know, some discussions that we had had, you know, last week and what we heard from, um, you know, people at the, the public hearing um, regarding two items that have been suggested by staff, one a, um, a $0.4 million item and another $0.3 million item. Um, so then uh, people had um, two amendments about how to, you know, spend that money or, you know, like yeah. changes um, to that full budget. So Abra, one of those was yours. Why don't you talk yes. about the 0.3 uh, so, you know, million dollars? Yeah. Um, so, you know, earlier on, part of the benefit of having a process that's a little bit longer is you have a back and forth with the superintendent. He gets a feel for what our perspectives are and we can adjust accordingly. So last uh, week when we were talking to him, he rescinded, he pulled two of his proposals. Um, one of those, uh, and that was also in part due, due to feedback that came in our public hearing, the budget hearing on Tuesday. So one of those is the um, principal pay parity, but not to say we're not going to consider it, but it's just we found it inappropriate to give raises to certain people when we weren't able to raise for teachers, right? So that amount of money was the 0.4, um, and I had an amendment with um, uh, Stella, Laura Jane, and um, Ricky to move that money since we're not using it this time around and put it towards counselors so yay that one passed and then the second one was also mine <laughs> um and that one been busy yeah <laughs> I, I have i <laughs> i, I could um, really uh, since i had like eight follow-on amendments to the cip <laughs> oh right yeah i mean that was totally your domain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and I remember finding you, I will just say this, you know, for the sake of viewers, Elaine was so diligent about the CIP. I walked into, before our meeting, I walked into one of the conference rooms and she's just sitting there with a whole spread of binders and notepads. Um, anyways, so I wanted to make sure people knew how hard you worked on that. Uh, but yeah, so the second amendment was moving the 0.3 million um, that Dr. Brebrand, when he rescinded his uh, proposal for the Office of School Supports, because the board wanted to look into that a little more, weren't ready to kind of put, put that forward, uh, moving that to support English language learners, K through eight in particular, because there's no existing program for them, uh, in particular in the summer. So that'll provide office hour supports for all English language learners, in addition to intensive supports for level one and level two students. Um, and that was in respon response largely to the Minority Student Achievement Oversight Committee, uh, teachers in, in ESOL who have been coming to, um, you know, speak to us, uh, some of the ESOL leadership that we have, uh, pretty much a consensus of folks in ESOL who found this to be a really important resource. Um, so those are the two amendments. Um, Elaine, can you see my, can you see the shared screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, so if it makes it any easier for you, you know, if you wanna see the, um, the motions and everything here as well. Uh, yeah, so, so, so yeah. the two amendments, the, the difference between the amendments and then the motions that we're talking about, the amendments had very specific dollars attached to them. It's like we were just talking about the $0.3 million and the $0.4 million. The motions are a little bit more like general, if you if you want to put it that way, that um, you know there aren't specific dollars. It's not directing the superintendent to spend a, a particular amount of money on a particular type of job or topic area, um, you know. But they were things that you know people felt strongly about that were things that needed a little bit more research or topics that. You know, we wanted to make sure that Dr. Brebrand and the rest of the staff understood were important topics to the board. Um, so we were able to go through, um, you know, all seven of those follow on motions and, you know, then vote on those. So um, we had, I probably might want to scroll up, you're just showing the, the or there, there they are, the omnibus follow on motions. Um, um, so like the first one was ensuring greater transparency and accountability in our budget process. We had a bit of a discussion about the fact that, you know, we have a set budget process and it includes um, input from the community, et cetera, but it kind of goes to what, what this amendment goes to, or I'm sorry, what the motion goes yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> um, that we were talking about a little bit earlier is we want to dig a little bit deeper. 
Uh, and so we are looking toward, um, you know, sort of opening up some of these other budget areas and getting um, much more in-depth information um, about them and, you know, having more, even more, you know, input from the public. So that's what that one is kind of, you know, what I'm going to read, I've got the, the board docs in front of me, they're easier for me to read than what's on the screen. Sure. But, or you can pick, um, you know, whichever ones you were most interested yeah. in. I think you had your, did you have your name on? Yeah. So I had, right? um, my yeah. name was on one or associated with, um, advanced Penny. academics. We, um, had our work session, you know, earlier this week was on advanced academics and, you know, we just received in and, you know, went over, um, a report that the previous board had actually commissioned um, from you know, some experts in advanced academics to take a look at. The, it, the report was very specific and then it looked at how can we make access to advanced academics more equitable. And so they came up with a set of recommendations. And um, you know, I, I feel strongly that advanced academics is a very important program that we have in FCPS. So um, the motion that I put forward with um, Ms. Darina Koufax was just that um, we want staff to take a close look at those recommendations in that report and then, you know, come back to us with their view on, um, you know, when we're looking at the year end money or um, we did put, have kind of a set aside in the current budget of $1 million for advanced academics. How do we want to spend that $1 million or maybe some of that year end money based upon the recommendations out of that report? So we're asking staff to give us their view on those recommendations. You know, we heard from these outside experts, but now we wanna hear from our own internal experts, what should we do? So um, that was um, number seven. Is, yeah, yeah, Elaine's and it passed in an omnibus. So, yeah, <laughs> and we're looking for, you know, tech, uh, reports on our technology use, um, you know, or, or an overall technology plan. Um, so that we don't, you know, have little snags like we had when we tried to start distance learning. Um, you and know. a communications plan for yeah. similar reasons. Yeah, exactly. And a, a really comprehensive look at um, communications in the district. And we do have a consultant that should be starting, uh, we're hoping in June, maybe sort of the second half of June to really look at our communications. And, and this is, I'm sure you guys could give us tons of comments on this. Um, you know, our internal communications, how do they really need to um, be most effective? Our external communications, how often do we need to be, you know, sending out information? How do we deal with information in the crisis? Um, you know, we've been doing it, but it can always be better. My poor kids, I always would drill into them. A little communication goes a long way. <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, you know, a huge example of that. So we, I do want to point out that, you know, um, we did specifically ask because we did take out that elementary school uh, principal pay raise or pay parity what it was called and uh, kind of reassign that money. One of our following motions was that, you know, we feel strongly that that is something that needs to happen sooner rather than later. So if in these quarterly budget reviews that we're having, if we find ourselves in a position where we do have the money available, um, making sure that our elementary school principals are paid properly is very high on our list. So that was one of the motions too. So yeah, those are just some of the examples. And omnibus meaning for, you know, that's kind of a clunky word. It's just an all encompassing follow on. So rather than having to vote one by one and waste time, uh, our budget chair and co-chair this year did a great job of kind of surveying the board. And for the ones that had general consensus, they put it all in one vote. Um, so it made it much easier for us. Yeah. yeah. And then after that, we had two follow on motions that were just timely. So one of them, the one that Elaine talked about earlier with the technology piece, because of new information we had received uh, due to the supply chain and what's available and what's not. Um, and the second one, which was an adjustment to my previous amendment, uh, just to make sure that we did pass it and got more support from board members uh, to take a look at the needs. Um, as, as Elaine actually mentioned earlier, 
for the wraparound services that we want to have for our kids um, that we can look at with the year end funding that we're going to have. So that's pretty much today, right? I mean, if you have, if you're interested, you can take a closer look here and you'll see the exact language on some of these. But Elaine, did you have anything to add about today? Other than, I mean, we went into closed after, but that was all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the real focus for today was the budget um, and, you know, getting it passed so then now staff can move forward, um, you know, with that direction. So, and it's already unbelievable as it is, it's toward the end of May. So, we definitely need to get organized and how this, you know, and this money starting in July. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what needs to happen is hiring new staff. And, um, you know, we even talked about it today. We want to get going on that because um, as we get into the summer, you know, people are going to be taking jobs with neighboring school districts, et cetera. And we want to try to nab the best people, um, you know, right now. So we got to get organized. That's right. Um, Kimberly, how was that? Do you have any questions? Was that primer good enough for our attendees? Yeah, I think I think my question was going to be, even though I knew I know the omnibus bill is because I learned it in AP Gov last year, I was going to ask that for clarification, because if I hadn't mm -hmm. taken government, I wouldn't know what it means. Um, but I think other than that, that was pretty concise and it put together because I think everybody who wa watches this regularly knows I'm not a number person. So this was really nice to be put together because I, whenever someone says like three billion in in my head, I just can't it's put it together how it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Um, obviously, for our audience, feel free to ask questions in the um, Facebook live chat, and we will be happy to answer them. If for now, I know Elaine, you have to hop off for another uh, kind of public, you know, briefing thing to to you know a committee. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I see yeah. Joanna Hemet. Yes, your next guest is here. Yeah, to give us the health update. So Elaine, um, Joanna, Elaine is my colleague on the board. She's from Hi, the Joanna. Drain Field District. Hi, nice to meet you. And nice she, uh, to meet you too. Joanna is the assistant uh, director at the health department. So yeah, you know, I actually pushed off my other meeting a little bit. So I definitely want to hear what Joanna has to say. So I'm oh, here. all right. Okay, well, welcome, Joanna. I'm going to stop screen sharing so that <laughs> we're not talking budget anymore here. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us again. It was lovely to have you the first time and appreciative. I know the workload is probably only increasing. So um, thanks for making the time. How's oh, it been on your end? Yeah, no, it, it's it's my pleasure to, to be able to participate in this. Actually, I really enjoyed it last time. So I, I appreciate it. And yeah, and things have been pretty, um, pretty crazy. You know, it's it's been very uh, much from what we've said all along, very unprecedented, and the situation evolves rapidly every day, um, every moment. Uh, so, I don't know, would you like me just to kind of give a little bit of an overview of where we are, like with some numbers and such? Um, sure, please do. Yeah, and you all, many of you probably do kind of tune in and keep track. Um, we do have a dashboard that is available on the county uh, website, and that's updated every day by 10 a.m. with the case counts locally. Um, and then just to kind of give you that perspective, I'll start with the United States, which is we are now, as of this today, as of 10 a.m. this morning, we are at about 1.5 million cases of COVID, uh, confirmed COVID cases in the United States in a little bit, um, well, now a little bit, more than 90,000 deaths in the United States. How does Virginia stand with that? Well, in Virginia, we've had um, 34,137 cases with uh, 1,099 deaths. So then we look at Northern Virginia, right, in Fairfax. Yeah. <laughs> so in Fairfax, as of today, we've had 8,677 cases with um, 317 deaths. Most of the deaths have been in long-term care facilities, older um, adults, 65 and older, um, in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And today we've had 423 new cases between yesterday and today. So that's a big jump. Um, and our, our jumps every day on average have been lately around up to 300 plus new cases confirmed a day. And um, that's partly because our testing capacity is increasing. So we are actually now able to do more tests, confirm more cases. Testing is becoming more accessible. 
Um, so, I mean, it's not a good thing that we have, but it's also partly the jump up is a reflection of that increased ability to get the testing and an increase in transmission in the community. We have widespread community transmission um, now. So um, a couple other things I did wanna point out that um, one of the things we're really focused on a lot in our community is the disparities that we see because now the numbers are beginning to be reported by ethnicity and race and zip code as well. And so we're really tracking that. And we see, for example, um, Hispanic population in our community in Fairfax County is at 16.8% of the population, yet the proportion of COVID cases confirmed in the Hispanic um, community is 63.5%. So that's more than three times as, as great that we are seeing the COVID in that population. There's a number of reasons of why we think we might be seeing um, such a high number in, in that population. And we have some very targeted efforts um, with the health department and the county and uh, private sector and community-based organizations to really try to address this as best we can. Um, but there are, there are a lot of factors that are contributing to that. So our health department actions are continuing at this time right now to focus on the high risk and the vulnerable communities, looking at those disparities. But we're also very much immersed in our plans going forward as we're looking at, yes, doing some phased openings, reopenings. Um, and so we are gearing up actually for what is called a tracing, a contact uh, tracing approach. And this is classic public health is what we do with all kinds of communicable diseases, but we can escalate this and put it on, you know, exponential growth. And so we are really looking at doing this large scale and hiring and um, many, many people um, to really boost up the capacity of our public health workforce. Uh, we're hoping to get um, what we call contact tracers on board within the next few weeks. And we will then also be looking at increasing testing capacity in the community. So when um, people are confirmed positive, the uh, information funnels over through the health department. A contact tracer would be involved to get in touch with that individual and identify all of the contacts that they can because the disease is transmitted, as we know, um, respiratory droplets. Um, which is why the face coverings are recommended. And so any contact who has been within close proximity of six feet or less for greater than 10 minutes would be considered a contact. Uh, so um, the contact tracers, identifying the contacts and then doing what we call um, recommendations, public health actions, which would be the quarantine. So someone who's sick with the illness is actually to isolate themselves and prevent infecting anyone else. And that isolation needs to happen for seven days in their own home, unless they're so sick and ill that they need to be hospitalized. Um, but they need to try as best they can in their own home. Um, some people have been finding, you know, we've been, or we've been helping with actually finding um, hotel rooms and such if some people wanna really get away a crowded household um, that has been one of the one of the things we're trying to address in the community but it's isolating to reduce the, the um, risk of contact with others who are well then those contacts to the sick person who are well identified are recommended to quarantine for a full incubation period of the virus which is 14 days so that's a long time and mm -hmm. people are told at that point that they really need to stay in quarantine in their own homes, um, reducing any contact with others to reduce the potential of transmission if they were to be sick. Because now we also know that you can have the disease and be asymptomatic, um, which is what we've seen, you know, some changes in what the recommendations are, which includes the, um, in addition to social distancing, the wearing of a face mask. Um, and that is primarily to reduce the, the potential for the person who's asymptomatic, that could be symptomatic, but asymptomatic is the real focus from transmitting the infection unknowingly because it is through respiratory droplets, touching one's face, eyes, nose, mouth, the face mask reduces the chance of that happening. Um, and also just coughing, sneezing, that sort of thing where the respiratory droplets may come out. So the face mask is to reduce what we call the source. Um, of the infection to reduce that possibility. So um, 
That again is something that we see now um, recommended. It is part of the recommendations um, now for those who are going out in the community. Social distancing is still the recommendations. We're still in um, what we call phase zero, <laughs> which is the governor's uh, mm -hmm. executive order that we still are currently in to stay in one's home unless you're going out for um, work um, medical care, grocery shopping, essential essential things that you need to do, and exercise outdoors, walking your dog, those kinds of things. But schools remain closed, universities remain closed, county government essentially remains closed, except for very essential services. So that is where we are now. We're continuing to see in Northern Virginia, as, as I stated earlier, the cases are going up still. The rate of increase is starting to decrease, meaning that we're, we're seeing that curve sort of begin to steady a little bit, but we're still rising. We're rising too fast to fully open. As So when you look at in Virginia, the phase zero to phase one, there are some things that we need to meet, some criteria. We need to see a downward trend in positive cases for a full incubation period, which is 14 days. So I said earlier, we had 423 new cases between yesterday and today. So we're definitely not there. Um, a downward tread in hospitalizations for over 14 days. Uh, increased ability to do testing and tracing. We're working very hard on that. And enough hospital beds and intensive care capacity so that the hospitals have the capacity to really um, address anyone who's very, very ill. And in order to do the, um, the testing as well as the hospitalization, we need to have enough what we call PPE, the personal protective equipment, and that has been you know, in shortage and continues to be. It's getting better. The supplies are getting better, more accessible, but we do continue to have some shortages on the, the um, access to personal protective equipment. Um, so those are, those are some things. Um, I'm trying to see, I had I've wrote, written a few other notes here about, um, uh, let's see, about Northern Virginia and moving into uh, reopening. So the criteria that I just discussed are some of the things that we would need to meet before we move into that. But the governor has extended for Northern Virginia through next Thursday midnight, so essentially Friday the 29th um, at this point, um, we expect that, that it would be opening into phase one. Um, but, you know, we don't know for sure about that. Phase one would mean um, physical distancing requirements are still um, going to be in place, which is six feet, um, greater, six feet or greater. Teleworking will still be um, the, the primary recommendation for going back to work whenever possible, that it would be telework. Um, limiting occupancy in, in places of business uh, to 50% or less than 10 people. Um, food and restaurants would still continue to be takeout, delivery, curbside pickup. Uh, so there's still a lot of restrictions in that phase one, but we're beginning to see some things open up at, at that phase one part, but schools were not one of them. <laughs> schools are not opening up in the phase one. Um, so um, what we would expect to see really is, is um, hopefully over time, we're gonna see a sustained reduction in that positive number of cases. But I think initially, as we begin to see an increase in the access to testing, we may see a jump. Um, and when we get sort of fluctuations in the case counts, like if you start looking at it every day, you're someday you might see 170 and the next day you're gonna see 300 and you're gonna wonder what's going on here. Well, that's a reflection of the data and there's um, testing results are coming in from a lot of different places private labs, public labs, um, and hospitals. So the variability in when that data comes in um, impacts the results of, the, of the, uh, the reporting of the cases. Sometimes there's a delay um, and then all of a sudden we get a dump <laughs> of the numbers. And so you'll see a jump like that. But what we're hoping that all of this will steady over time and we'll have more consistency in terms of testing and reporting of that data and then we are going to be gearing up to do what that I mentioned earlier was the contact tracing and identifying anyone who has a positive in the community and being able to limit the, um, the risk of spread to others. 
and then we will be able to hopefully contain this. And then we'll get to a vaccine, or therapy and treatment options. You know, those are the things that we are, we need to really be seen in our community in order to really move to a fuller opening um, of the community. But as I said in the beginning, this is such an evolving situation. The decisions that we make are really driven by the data and the information that we have at hand, which changes. And, and we've been seeing that as we learn more and more about this disease. Um, so it's been, it's been quite the challenge. Um, I, bet. And I, I think that's kind of all I had and thought I, I wanna make sure there's some time for questions because I know last time I think we ran out of time. <laughs> well, so, so I fixed that issue. So we're good as long as you are, so <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for checking on that. Um, but no, thank you for that overview. It's very helpful. I, I especially appreciate you highlighting the difference between mm -hmm. us and the rest of the state. That's something that has been a little misleading for people, right? Then governor yeah. initially came out with these phasing out and everyone got excited, um, but we're nowhere near. And and I am curious, I mean, you mentioned in um, on the 29th year, we're supposed to, according to the governor, yes. in phase one, I'm hearing we're not ready for that, but I, I'd love to hear your, feel or take or whether you guys are in communication right now, even with, uh, with, with state officials. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I mean, I don't know, we, we um, are in communication with the Virginia Department of Health on a regular basis and, and the information that the governor is using is what's, what's he, what he receives through the Virginia Department of Health, hospital data and, and all of that to inform the decisions. Initially, he um, was planning to come out with a universal recommendation across the whole state and not differentiate between one um, you know, locality versus another. But the Northern Virginia health directors and the Northern Virginia um, you know, government officials came together in unison and um, prepared justification for why Northern Virginia should follow a different kind of drumbeat here. And for all the reasons that I just described and that our numbers are, are really, we are 70% of the cases in the state are in Northern Virginia. <laughs> so we have a much different picture than in other parts, um, Southwestern Virginia, for example, is much lower. And so he definitely listened to that and made that decision. I can't tell you what's next week going to bring. I don't know. I think we didn't know until it happened, you know, what his decision would be. Uh, so it's again, looking at the data every day, looking at that and seeing what the trends are saying and what the decisions, there's a lot of different factors that go into that. I'm sure a lot of pressures um, in making decisions like that, the impact on, on economy and on um, people has been great. It's been huge. Um, and what people are going to need to continue to do regardless until we really reach that point of vaccine and um, therapeutic options that, that can address this very effectively. It's social distancing, hand washing. If you feel sick, you stay home and you isolate yourself. Those are the tried and true recommendations that will continue regardless. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. On the point of masks, because I know this has been, you know, some of the news flying around that cloth masks don't work and you need, you know, a more heavy duty mask and can you help mm -hmm. clarify some of that for folks to know what they need, you know, what the minimum they would need to stay safe? Yeah, well, um, the, again, the mask is to protect the source, is to protect the person who may be asymptomatic, not knowing they're sick from um, transmitting any kind of virus. And the cloth masks, and there's a lot of information out there about the kinds of cloth, what cloth works better, you know, and how many layers of cloth, and to use a coffee filter in that. There's a number of, of um, you know, sites one can go to on the CDC. We have videos of how to make one on the, on the county website. And um, the important thing is how to wear it, how to put it on, how to take it off and how to wear it. And it really needs to cover your mouth and nose, both. It needs to have a certain kind of tightness of fit that you're, you are able to feel it snug on the face, a fit over the nose. Some masks will have like a little kind of, um, a wire or a little kind of metal piece in it that allows you to fit it over your nose. And those are better. Those are really better if you can find those or make them. And um, pipe cleaners are used as well, I've heard, to put in that little insert there. 
um, to make it fit over your nose. And then putting it on um, and taking it off is important that you're, you're taking it off in a way that you're not contaminating um, or exposing yourself to potentially any, any of the germs. So I recommend you take it off basically like it's on your ear. I don't have one on right now. I have a few over here in the corner, but, um, uh, but you're taking it off and you're not touching the actual mask itself. You're touching the parts that are fitting over your ear and you should be washing them. You should have many of them. If you're using cloth masks, the recommendation is to wash them every day. And then the use of the, you know, hospital or medical um, grade masks, the N95s and then other more surgical masks, really still there is not an overabundance of supply of that equipment. And so it still is the recommendation to let the medical and the healthcare workers um, in the community and those who are doing testing are going to be needing these masks. Um, and then the, you know, general public is to use the cloth masks. Thank you. Um, Elaine and Kim, by the way, feel free to jump in here with any questions that you might have. Um, I certainly have a line up here. So it, unless, yeah, um, <laughs> you, um, you know, with the social isolation, I did want to make sure we addressed Memorial Day, oh, yeah. which is coming up and people are making plans. Uh, you know, just yesterday at the dinner table, my family was debating, no, we're not going anywhere. No, let's go somewhere, you know, oh, <laughs> so yeah. let's hear, you know, your perspective. I, I'm a big no. So uh, <laughs> we're not at that point yet from the science and the data. Um, but give us your perspective. What are what are options if people have any, you know, um, maybe yeah. alternatives? Well, and that's true. We really aren't there yet. We're not at that open opening stage. We will still be in what uh, the governor has called phase zero, um, which um, there may be some, um, I'm thinking in terms of parks, I think I saw something about some of the parks having a certain restricted amount of opening up, but they're not fully open. The recommendation is to, if you are to gather together with family, you know, with your household, with your family, Anybody who may be very vulnerable in your in your family that isn't really with you um, day in and day out, maybe visiting an older relative, for example, who may be more, or one who may have a chronic illness and may be more vulnerable would probably be not be recommended to come together. Um, but again, if you are, because this is so difficult, it is to maintain that social distance unless you are with the people you're with all the time, your family, um, your household members. Uh, so otherwise, it's to maintain that six feet of distance. Um, and, you know, it's also, if, if concerned to wear the fa face mask, even in your own home, especially if you are around people in your household who are more vulnerable, it, is, it would be to protect them, not to protect you, it would be to protect them. If you may be asymptomatic, you don't want to transmit anything potentially to your grandparent, for example, um, then you would be wearing a face mask to protect them. It's hard. <laughs> I think yeah. that, that that you can go fishing and what I, and you can go and you can exercise outdoors in the parks and they're allowing some fishing and maybe some other kind of recreation, but it's still very limited. Gathering less than 10 people, 10 or 10 or less. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'll I'll say this too. Uh, the, there's a the Eid holidays coming up this Sunday. Yes. Everybody's trying to go congregate to pray or do something, yes. you know, the ho holiday service. Uh, but we are staying home. Everybody, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's it is unfortunate, but um, hopefully, it is. Yes, it is very, and it's getting very hard for people. I know. I mean, there, I, I, there's mobility data they talk about, you know, with cell phones and such, and they're seeing a lot more traffic and there's a lot more traffic out there, and um, it, it's just it is very hard. Yeah. So you're 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 saying that um, you guys are seeing trends that folks are continuing to go out there. Well, we're not we're not in our health department watching that, but we see that in other um, parts of the country that's being tracked. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and then I just can say anecdotally, you know, that I see it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, got, I I still come um, actually into I telework a little bit, but I actually come into the office, and um, so I am seeing. Definitely a change in the traffic pattern. I'd say traffic out there. one to two weeks, it's been an, an increase. And well, I hope, yeah, I mean, I hope we can get the county information out there because, you know, I don't know, maybe the governor's uh, announcement has something to do with that. But yeah. 
Um, I, you mentioned hotspots, so I wanted to go into that a little bit. Uh, we know, you know, particular members of our community are affected more than others. Yes. Um, how do you guys go about identifying those? How do you, you know, in, what do you do uh, in, in kind of trying to contain uh, the virus? Yeah, so it's identified by the testing. So when um, an individual is going for a test, certain information is collected, there are residents, you know, where they live, the zip code they live in, um, and they're, they're collecting now race and ethnicity data, um, but that's not complete. So when we're starting to report out on that race and ethnicity and even the zip code data, um, that is a recent change. And so we're, see, we're able to report out and identify more of the locations where we're seeing what you might call a hotspot. And um, it is it's purely that, it's the information collected on testing and then when it's positive, identity, mapping it out and, and seeing that that's the location. Um, we, in the, as I mentioned earlier, the county government, the health department, uh, community-based organizations, um, many, many folks are involved with trying to really address this from more of the ground level um, and getting out there in the community um, and trying to really, really instill the message of how to protect oneself, um, how to make sure, you know, following the social distancing and, and um, all the recommendations that we have to prevent getting infection. And then how to access care, because that's been another difficult challenge, is accessing the testing. Testing is becoming more available, um, more available free of charge, more available to those who are uninsured. And then making sure if somebody is identified positive and doesn't have a medical home, doesn't have insurance, how do we connect them to care? Um, so that's been another, another huge effort. And then we have um, many people who are really struggling with getting, you know, resources, food, um, and other resources. And so there's been again a huge community effort to try to address that as best as, as we can. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. And for folks who know anyone that needs that kind of service, um, our schools are providing yes. meals. You yes. know, that results mm -hmm. posted on the website, and there are local businesses too that have been offering weekend meals. Um, yeah. There's a lot of community that, that is like the positive thing to see is is really um, that sort of spirit in the community of coming together to mm -hmm. really try to help um, those who, who are really struggling with this. The other thing that I think we are, are noting is the um, isolation that people are going through and some of the mental health impact. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just been very, very difficult for many, many people. Uh, we do provide some ongoing services from the health department virtually that normally would be doing done by home visit, but we're not doing home visiting, but through the vi virtual visits, we are definitely seeing an uptick in some things that are very concerning, domestic violence and, and you know, depression and anxiety. Yeah, no, I appreciate you mentioning that. Our, yes, I'm sorry, I do need to stuck out now for my next meeting. Oh, okay. Thank you very much thank for having me, uh, Joanna. Thank you so much. It was really nice to meet oh, you. Oh, yes. Kimberly, thank thanks you. as always thanks, Elaine, for, for your great on. work. Oh, yeah, you. absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. You thank too. You. Thanks. Bye bye. But yeah, to, to your point on the um, resources, you know, uh, for folks, whether it's domestic violence, um, supplementary income, whatever it might be that folks need, I do want to direct you all, you know, our viewers, we had a session with the Department of Family Services. Um, so be sure to check out some of the stuff posted there. Even in the yeah. description, we outlined a number of, you know, uh, phone numbers and different hotlines that could be used um, to, to be supports. Uh, and we also had a session on mental health. Mm -hmm. so that's another piece, folks. Great, you know, very timely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and there were a number of good resources, you know, that some of our uh, guests there mentioned. So be sure to take care of yourselves and your families. Yes. Um, yeah. I know Kim had a question. Yes, so I actually just wanted to kind of like gauge like this question. So basically, I've been seeing a lot like in terms of like teenagers and stuff. I, I think a lot of my classmates, I think a lot of them not really getting the idea of like mm -hmm. just how important social distancing is, because I see a lot of my friends, um, unfortunately, hang out large groups, hang out mm -hmm. without masks. And I think a lot of the problem is that a lot of students think that, oh, if it's just I'm just one person, I'm not going to be the one to like hurt anybody it's just me yeah and I just want to like ask like what do you can you like say like 
what is like the outcome of everyone, like say multiple people having this outcome? And do you think that if people continue to have this outcome, there is a chance that like this um mindset, there's a chance that there will be like a resurgence in that virus or like just us continuing to be in this certain situation for longer? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we don't know, but I, the modeling that has been done um, by a number of different um, kind of universities and institutions based on um, looking at the data of, um, in, of following through on some of these recommendations like the social distancing and wearing of masks, and they've been able to do all kinds of mathematical modeling to um, show when uh, the restrictions are in place and the, the numbers start to steady and reduce, and then you lift, you gradually lift those restrictions, and then you start to see the upticks again. And, and that's where we really need to be watching the data very closely, making decisions that are very informed by that data, and then making sure we have the capacity to address that. And so that's what going forward with the really boosting up our workforce in public health to do the contact tracing, try to identify people as quickly as we can, isolate, quarantine, reduce the spread. And this is going to pre probably be the way until we get a vaccine, we get you know therapies to treat. Um, but I understand what you're saying about youth and vulnerable, you know, it's not gonna impact me. It's not as impactful on young people, but now we're beginning to see some of these, you know, very worrisome pediatric um, cases. So that isn't true. Um, and then the other thing is, is you can definitely be asymptomatic and um, be then at risking others who may be vulnerable, whether it is a young person who, who's got vulnerabilities due to chronic illness or an older person who may be vul more vulnerable. Um, so it's difficult. It's difficult to get the message out. I wonder, do you have any suggestions? How do we, because <laughs> that is something that I think, you know, we struggle with a bit. How do we get the message out in a way that it's going to change the behavior, especially among youth? I mean, we, you know, it's, it's very difficult. I think like one of the biggest issues is that um, a lot of students believe that it won't affect them or their families. Yes. And I think even though that is kind of like, in my opinion, a selfish way of thinking, but I still but like they're still um they still have that mindset. I can't change that. So I feel as if like having like kind of something that's personable, just like, mm -hmm. hey, like actually drilling into their mind that even if you believe it cannot affect you, these are st statistics that say you can catch it. It's in your area. Like there are people in your community who have it. Like to kind of like make it real for them. I think yeah. it's not real enough for people. Like yeah. for a lot of students, it's not like the thing since they haven't seen it, like certain of the family members haven't caught it, it's not real enough for them to care enough, which is kind of like ridiculous, I'll admit, but it is the reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's common. <laughs> I, um, I think we, you know, we see it and in a different parts of the country. If you, you start watching what's going on in other parts of the country and you see as they're opening up more um, and um, people are in restaurants and bars and beaches and stuff and it's like whoa <laughs> it's a bit worrisome um I, I i don't know what we're going to what we're going to see but um you know what the modeling shows is the mathematical modeling shows that you would probably expect an increase in cases when when things open up and people don't practice the precautions the social distancing the wearing of the mask um and washing and if they're ill to stay home. Yeah, I was gonna also commend Kimberly. I know she, um, the, the school system and Kimberly worked together to produce a video oh, uh, where she talks about the risks and why you need to stay home and six feet apart and all of that. Yes, yes, that's um, great. Yeah, continue. And that's probably the best way. I'm telling you, I, from what I, I see too, getting the message from the, me the messengers being, <laughs> you know, um, youth themselves, you all and, and your, you know, peers um, really have probably the most influence more than, well, more than parents often, unfortunately, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it, it's really a challenge, but it's not just the youth. I mean, it's a challenge with a lot of the population. Um, I imagine we're talking behavior change. Behavior change is so hard. Nobody wants to be told how to live and how to, you know, be right. and go. 
Um, but I, I wonder if celebrities or yeah, folks with influence. Yes, influencers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a, a move. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking even if we had all the public officials just do a quick clip, that could be beneficial. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, in thinking about, all right, so someone can be 14 days without even realizing they have it. Mm. Um, my dad works in the hospital. My siblings and I almost on a daily basis urge him to get tested. Um, so where is testing? You know, we started our first, mm -hmm. first session together. Testing was limited. It wasn't right. as, you know, widely available. For, but now if folks are feeling, you know, the sniffles or fever or have reason to believe they might have it, where do they go? What do they do? Yeah, so it's still it's still somewhat limited, but it is increasing in the capacity um, for testing. And like uh, maybe around the time when we were talking, I think we might have been around 50 tests a day, and now we're at around 700 tests a day. But we still we are trying to aim much higher. We need to get to a higher level, but we have increased quite a bit. So in um, there are testing in many of the um, private labs. Do them. You're going to a private doctor and um, have, are symptomatic. Um, some of them are able to do the test more and more. A large practice, for example, should be able to do the test. Um, maybe, uh, you know, um, well, anyway, labs and, and even the private providers, hospitals are doing the test more universally. And then in addition, it's available through federally qualified health centers and some other community clinics. And we are um, going to be, um, Working, we're working with the state, actually, the Virginia Department of Health, to try to um, pu push forward some community-based clinics. There are a couple of them that are happening this weekend uh, in Fairfax County. There have been some that have been happening in some of the other localities across the state as well, which would be free of charge, um, walk up or drive in uh, to to have a test. Uh, still, the um, the push is that symptomatic people are getting tested in a private provider's office or in labs. Um, but I think we may see as the testing capacity increases, there may be more, um, more, you know, reaching out to even the asymptomatic. Right now, it's still, it's still more limited than we want it to be. We're still, Virginia is not doing as well as we wish we were, but we're working towards towards having an increased capacity is one of the things we really do need to have in place for, for um, an accurate picture of the disease prevalence in our community. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna. And, and I do wanna be mindful of your time. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add on this or um, otherwise I have my final question for you. Oh. <laughs> Um, since you didn't get to do this last time and I did have it planned, I did oh. want to ask you for your kind of message of hope to the community. Uh, we always like to wrap up with something, you know, a little uplifting, so. Yeah, well, I think, I think again, one of the really positive things that this, this has done um, is really bringing um, families together in, in ways that um, they probably never thought they would have a chance to, to do or, even imagined, and um, it's brought out a lot of creativity, um, a lot of innovation, um, a lot of you know, kind of collective good, and and that's just been really inspiring to see uh, and sensitivity to more vulnerable populations and how can we help, and I think that's been just wonderful, and I hope that that carries forward. I hope that that we continue to carry that forward, and I think that we will, we will, we will get there. We will eventually reach that point where we're going to have an effective vaccine. Um, I don't know when exactly, but we will get there. Then it will be, how do we get everybody to get the vaccine? Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be the next thing. Um, but I do think, you know, we are a community that has a lot of resources and a lot of very smart people and a lot of people who really are passionate and care a great deal about the community. And together we're really doing, doing a, lo a lot to try to address this as best we can. That's my message. Um, thank you so much. No, it's wonderful. You're right. I mean, we've seen such great things and really it's about the timing, right? It's gonna happen. We're all gonna get back together yep. and, and just a matter of time. There's gonna be light under, you know, at the end of the tunnel but we just shouldn't rush ourselves there because maybe then you know we'll we'll quash the light a little bit. It won't it won't be as bright, right? Yes. So, 
Yeah, we need to make sure when we get there, it is it is very a solid, good, strong light. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. That we're ready. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing all the information, for tuning in. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll ask you to come back on at some point for additional updates. Uh, but really appreciate it for now. I'm gonna have Kimberly share some resources. Won't want to take up your time with that. But okay, well, yeah, I enjoyed it, and um, we continue to work too with the school system as we're you know moving forward in the county and the schools um, and the health department um, as we work towards an eventual reopening. And what is that going to look like Absolutely. in a safe, you guys. safe manner? <laughs> Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Sharon. Oh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you very Have much. Have a rest of your evening. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Um, so for our viewers, as Joanna mentioned, you know, the health department is constantly in communication with our school system. Uh, we actually had a representative from the health department in our budget, or sorry, in our school board uh, meeting, in our public meeting when we were discussing return to school. So if you're interested in seeing the, you know, conversation, uh, having the, that in mind, uh, feel free to take a look on the YouTube channel for the recording. To close us off, uh, Kimberly is going to share a number of resources that we've been holding and wanting to share at each session, but have always uh, kind of ran out of time. But And then we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up. So please, Kimberly. All right, so briefly. So the Fairfax County Public Schools will be hosting a virtual instructional job fair. So they're looking for um, educators with strong academic backgrounds for the 20, um, 2021 um, school year. It'll take place um, Tuesday, May 26th, Wednesday, May 27th, and Thursday, May 2nd, May 28th. I forgot off the number, but yes. So make sure that you, when you go on the FCPS website, just scroll to the um, bottom, like click on the main um, sidebar, scroll to the bottom, and it should be there. Um, the Fairfax County Public Library is offering reading help for um, students K through six, um, Mondays through Thursdays from 10.30 to 1 p.m. The Fairfax County government is launching a parent support line and will be hosting an online parent cafe on Monday evenings where parents can connect with each other to process um, and process through everything and share different strategies. So that will be held on a conferencing app Zoom on Monday evenings from 7 p.m. Um, 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. So you have to register at least 30, 24 hours ahead of time and I'm, by calling 703 three two four seven seven two zero or you can send an email to building stronger families at, F at fairfaxcounty.gov building stronger families at fairfaxcounty.gov and that's posted in the description of our department of family services uh video mm -hmm. so and for digital citizenship which is very important in this time so there is access there should be access to tip sheets uh, in multiple languages and recorded videos to help so you can just go on to the FCBS website in search of digital citizenships um, families and how to get through the loss of a, fam a friend or a loved one. Um, you, they have, um, what's it called? This, it's in our health and student wellness tips and strategies page. And this should be very helpful for um, some of our community members who may unfortunately have lost um, a loved one during this um, unfortunate situation. So if this is, could be any help to you or any of your friends or um, neighbors, please feel free to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for sharing those resources. As always, we will be tuning in at 7 p.m. Thursdays and Sundays. Um, we are looking forward to a number of organizations that are gonna share the resources they have to join us on Sunday. And then the following week on Thursday, we will be with Chairman Jeff McKay uh, to hear a little bit about what's been going on on the county side of things, uh, because we are always in collaboration with them. So until then, uh, be in touch if you need anything, and we will see you on Sunday at 7 p.m.